I find that uh, ran for a real retirement at 80 has helped or something. So right now he's bringing in, I've noticed about one book every five years. One book every five years. So Kunal, you are not too far behind, you took only 25. Never mind, and I'm also way behind. Now, for those who are not familiar with Professor Ralph Nicholas, he's one of the first uh, prominent anthropologists who camped, literally camped with, uh, with uh, minor difficulties in toilet and other things that happened in villages. And an age in uh, a village, I mean I know it, Kelawal, in, in Mandapur district. And uh, we had issues about his selection of this thing, selection of the village because it was upper caste. Uh, I mean they had a lot of upper caste castes there which is not very difficult of Mandapur. In any case, this book brings out in minute detail that only an anthropologist aided by his wife and a collaborator, Parashish Babu, have documented for us. It helps us first know what exactly is the year-long cycle of rituals in a typical village. All other are variations there. If you go to Punjab village, you won't find much of a difference except that uh, at that point of time. B, it helps us document the transition we have made from the 60s, 70s till today when we have trivialized many of these as superstitions and some of our hangovers of our past because they talk about the very roots of our culture. They are actually the little knots that tie us together. Uh, third, we can also study the tremendous variation, standardization, homogenization that has taken place in the last 40-50 years that has smothered to a large degree the active diversity and heterogeneity that we then had. We were in a formative stage of our culture. We had emerged from a colonial Raj, which of course hardly, in fact, I would put it in a more, um, more, um, more charitable manner when I say that actually most of the studies of these, these studies actually began during the colonial period. They were done by uh, amateur ethnographers that I, that I pretend to be without much of learning, without much of methodology, but they have actually documented and kept behind what India was. This 13 festivals was a title that I had kept from my book which he has plagiarized or rather he has got it first so I lose out. 13 festivals is, is a, just a common saying in Bengal, in Bengal that Baro Mas, Baravasi, that's 12 months, we have 13 festivals. The number is supposed to indicate that we have more festivals than the number of months. Now coming straight to the point on that, because while he plods in the paddy fields taking copious notes, chaps like me can go on a helicopter over his view and give comments from, from the top and that's exactly what we have done. Now these festivals, the first one was the word Tera or 13. Why do we have so many festivals? Ralph has helped me work a lot on these in a very methodical manner. Enthusiasm is not a substitute for erudition. It is not. Enthusiasm can lead you up to a point where you leave the billiards table, where you leave the Saturday parties and take a second class train and camp in a village for four days. You can do that. But you can't sort of get along without methodology, without vision, without formal education, stuff like that. So we went it. Now I would submit that the reason for 13 festivals or a large number of festivals is an observation that we often do not see, visualize. Uh, we are not a Semitic religion. I refer to we means the religion of my ancestors. India, or 85% of India does not believe in Semitic structured religions. Which means we don't have a Sabbath, the first thing that hits you. We don't have a Friday, Juma. We don't have a Saturday. 
attendance at the shul. We don't have a Sunday church. There is no compulsion. Now apart from compulsion comes the need for a break in your lives. And in one of my writings a few years ago I had pointed out that instead of four weekends or four Sabbaths, we take it all out on the monthly festival. You can't but not water your fields. We went by the agricultural cycle, so we can't say this is Sabbath day so I don't go to the fields. We had to go. But then at periodic intervals of the agricultural cycle, we took it all back. Which explains why in America or in the US uh, or in the UK, we'll find the only doctors who work over the weekends are Indians. They don't have any sense of this is a weekend, yay, this is Friday, nothing of the sort. So that's a core of what I would say the festivals. He and I will heartily disagree over it on some time, but so that's it. What Ralph's book does is to document them with the precision of an anthropologist, which becomes basic material, a textual reference for people like us. The second reason is, I discovered to my horror when I went out of my urban habitat for the first time in 1975 properly, that India was completely, Bharat was completely different from India. Completely different ballgame. Let me explain. Every festival in its own way is a little knot that has tied India. A Magna Carta. India is a product of a series and series of agreements arrived at the local level which goes up to the translocal which goes up to the regional and then to what we call now the national. Uh, any festival, I'll the, uh, can, I, can I mention because your book also gives it, the first festival that I came across was something that I had never believed. It was in a small village in Bardhavan which has now grown to a township of sorts called Hat Govindapur. Hat means a village in Govindapur. And there we found that on a particular date of the year I was told, the young guy, you must come on that day, that is our village day. So every village has a village day also, so called. That's another thing. Must come on this parab or this festival. And I went there and I was made to go through an awful, uh, uh, wake up at an awful time at about 3 o'clock in the morning, which I never do. I've, in fact, it's one of the rare times I saw something called a sun. Uh, and then we found that the temple gates have been kept open. And early in the morning, the dome, domes represent a very, uh, the basic community of indigenous people, if I may put it. It's hard to say for it being an indigenous Indian to call somebody else indigenous is rather depraving. But let's put it like that. They would be termed as what in social language is called a low caste. It's, uh, they had kept and they were drinking all night. Early in the morning, they went and the Purohit, the, the priest had removed the brass idol, the brass image. And behind it was a piece of stone, a shila, which had been covered with vermilion. They looked at that, I had to follow them with my box camera. They got so drunk, they said, no box camera with you. And then they started abusing the piece of stone in the vilest of language. You slut, you stayed with the Brahmins, etc., etc., etc. And then they had a palanquin in which they took the stone out. And this was a ritual bath, which they went along with all sorts of musical instruments and a lot of cacophony. Halfway through, they were joined by another group, which was middle social. By the time they went to the tank, the village tank, to bathe this god, I was wondering whether she would fall into the tank because they were not. They got into a fight, mud fight, with the third agriculture group. And it went on. Finally, the clean procession went on. It was the lowest group in front, middle class second, the third agricultural class, the agricultural class third, and it went on. The Brahmin was number seven in the pegging order. And the Kayasta, the Zamindar, was number nine. This was one day the social order was established. And it, in one festival, we had encompassed the history of the village and the, the habitat through a ritual enactment of what was a reality. 
In other words, you would unravel it in this manner that this aniconic, non-iconic image was supposed to be some sort of a godhead. She, it was a she. There are many cases where you don't ascribe a gender to it also. In, in, in Odisha, Jagannath's predecessor, the Kambeshwar, doesn't have a gender. It's Kambeshwar, Kambeshwar, it's spiritual. So gender ascription also comes in from formal religion. A godhead is a godhead. It was a she, and over time, agriculture, agriculturists came and settled in the village. They, the mock fight that they had was just living out the original struggle they used to have with these agricultural fellows. As, the, as cultivation spread on, deforestation took place, dewatering took place, this became a settlement. And the appropriation, final appropriation of this piece and its replacement or its, let us say, its, uh, its acquisition of an anthropomorphic image, a human-like image that was placed in front was made so that the rest of the people who were not engaged in this mumbo jumbo would understand that this is a goddess X who could be identified taxonomically into this class and therefore falls into this broad Devi group. That's all. I have gone rather fast but I hope you get my point. So the idol of the anthropomorphic image is not the source of energy. The source of energy is that piece of rock. That's it. So I have given just a, one crude example just came to my mind. So every ritual under cover of Setala, under cover of Shashti, under cover of Lakshmi, under cover is actually the reenactment of how we got our act together. When you think of a country that doesn't have a Vatican uh, defined papacy and cardinals, when you don't have uh, the rabbi or the or the or the Kohen, you don't have anything. You don't have a caliphate. This amorphousity has actually been of great assistance to us. This vagueness has been our greatest strength, because at every level, as you moved along progressively, absorbing, appropriating, assimilating, accepting, and moving, rolling on, you erased the last part of it, so that you did not carry hangovers of memories. The difference of at each level we have had this people coming out of the one, the, the forest to form the Shetra and this is the story. So in my, my submission is that beyond the, the, this is a basic work from which we can derive a lot of interesting. Ralph's work covers in, in, in as I said, I went through it last night finally, it covers and uh, the, my, the, the one that was given to me is pockmarked with pencil, pen, whatever was next, next to it. It's come out splendidly. His earlier work was on Shetala. In fact, uh, and um, the fruits of worship was a collection of his essays. When I stumbled into this subject from abject ignorance to some sort of literacy in this, I had to read a lot of his work and a lot of his predecessor's work to come to what I call the barely legible stage. And there, his way, the way he has worked, the way he has portrayed it, the way he has detailed it, would be extremely useful to any person who wants to know how India got its act together. With these words, I commend you, I congratulate you. I thank the University of Chicago for setting up such a wonderful center here. I mean, the first day I came in, I wish I could really retire and come and spend more time here. I think I'll do it. I'll, I'll carry out my threat. <laughs> and uh, uh, I have yet to go through a library. I'm sure you'll be having an excellent one. And we should have these interactions about what constitutes the core of our civilization. It is not done in cyclostyle or performa or boxed or pigeonhole manner. It's one of the wonderful cases where people got together, struggled, they had their quarrels, and then they signed pacts, and they made it all into rituals. Rituals. And these rituals are the last remnants that we have of how we got, how we all came together. Thank you very much. <laughs>